y'all. Welcome back. I'm Mama Dr. Jones, a board certified OBGYN, a mom to four, and this is just a little life update video. You've all been asking me about how the move to Aotearoa, New Zealand has gone. Aotearoa. And what the differences are between being an ob here versus in the United States. So I thought I would give you a little update and just talk a little bit about our time since we arrived. I asked you on Instagram and in the community tab on YouTube what questions you had, and I'm going to try to go through some of the more common questions today. If you're new here and you'd like to subscribe, we would love to have you. I talk about all things periods, pregnancy, sex ed, everything in between. Hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss an upload. Let's jump into the video. So to catch everybody up, if you're new here or you just simply don't follow my life, I, I don't blame you for that. I was born and raised in Texas, did all of my training there, and I worked in Texas, in Hawaii, we lived in Utah and Colorado for short periods of time. In November of 2021, we made the move to the South Island of New Zealand. Where are we going tomorrow? Uh, to New Zealand. Where? To New Zealand. How do you feel about it? I don't care. <laughs> Okay, cool. And that's where we live now. We spent almost two weeks in a hotel quarantine, which was an experience with four children. like a bad idea. You're stuck in the boat? And we survived that and then we finally got to come down to the very south part of the South Island and I'm working here now for almost six months. So it's been a really, really excellent experience. The people that I work with, the other doctors, the midwives, staffing, nurses, everybody is incredible. I feel really lucky to have such a great team. We also have a really wonderful neighborhood who has just become our little Kiwi village. I just, I'm a little bit of an introverted person. I don't just make friends very easy. And I know it seems like in my videos, maybe that I'm not, but you have to remember I'm talking to a camera. There's nobody else in here, just me and the camera. And then, you know, the hundreds of thousands of you who might end up watching this eventually, but I don't see you. And so I don't feel as weird. I don't know. It is weird. I'm on a tangent. Okay, you get the point. Anyway, we have made wonderful friends in our neighborhood and feel very lucky to have a very supportive little village who loves us and our kids and is there for us if we need anything. I would say one of the most common questions that I've gotten is what are the differences in healthcare here versus back in the United States? And the obvious answer to that is there's socialized medicine here. So your healthcare coverage is free for the most part. And that is, it's been an interesting experience. I do think this is superior because people don't go into massive debt trying to get care. And I do think that the care is just as good. The downside is that it often takes a long time for people to get in with a specialist and for gynecology that is considered a specialist. As opposed to the US where people just made an appointment with me, here people get referred to me by their GP who does all of their standard care, including birth control visits, pap smears, breast cancer screening, all of those things that I did back home. I only really get like higher level gyne consults, procedural gyne, surgical gyne. And then for the maternity side, we have something called LMCs or lead maternity carers, which are midwives who take care of people through their pregnancy. And everybody sees a midwife unless you live somewhere that has a private system for obstetrics and you have the option of paying and doing that. But we don't have a private obstetrician in my town. So where I live, which is relatively rural, we only have midwives and then they get referred to us for more complex things like twins or diabetes or problems with the ultrasound, things like that. They still continue to see their midwife throughout the pregnancy. And the midwife is who is responsible for delivering at the time that the baby's ready to come. With the exception of if there's a problem during labor, they will call us in for vacuum or forceps or C-section or heavy bleeding or 
fetal heart rate problems, all of those things, they'll consult us in the process of labor. So we work really closely with the midwives and it's a really great relationship and I think it's really excellent. The downside to that system is that because they get such one-on-one -on -one care from their midwife, including most of the midwives going to the patient's home for visits and coming to their home to see them after the baby's born to do weight checks and make sure breastfeeding's going well and all these things, because it's like that, the system is really hard on the midwives. And it is concerning to me that they are very, very spread thin. And I don't know if it will be a forever system here because I watch how hard they work and how little they're compensated for that very demanding work. And I just worry that it's everybody's not going to be willing to do that for the rest of their life because I think that would be a very difficult job. They're amazing and wonderful. I love working with them. The downside is that I don't think it's very friendly to the midwives a lot of the time. I love that I get to practice really like at the top of my scope. So instead of doing things that I learned to do in medical school or my first year of residency, I'm either doing higher level gyne, colposcopy, surgery, procedures, high risk consults, higher risk deliveries, things like that. So I enjoy that because that's what I like about this field. So for me, this is a great practice model and I don't know how I will find a job when we go back to the States because I love being able to do what I do here in the way that I do it. Are there any adjustments as to how you go about treating a patient due to the cultural and social differences in New Zealand? There's definitely a few differences, particularly that the indigenous people of Aotearoa, which are the Maori people, have guidance in all of the things that we do. Their culture is highly regarded here for the most part, as it should be. And so there is a treaty that's one of the founding documents of this country called Te Tiriti Waitangi, and I butchered that. I'm sorry, I'm doing my best. Tiriti Waitangi. That means the Treaty of Waitangi, and it is the founding documents of the country when it was colonized. Maori people should be involved in making sure that the access to and distribution of health care is equitable. They should be involved in the process of how to distribute those things and making sure that their cultural practices and beliefs are integrated into that. One of the things that relates to that that some of you may find interesting is a tikanga, tikanga. or a cultural practice that is customary within a lot of Maori populations is that if you have any tissue that belongs to your body that is removed for whatever reason at any point, a lot of people in the Maori culture will like to take the tissue and bury it on land they find to be important to them spiritually. So they often will request to have any tissue returned to them, and that includes placentas, but also ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, anything that they want. Our routine consent form here always asks if we take out any tissue, would you like it returned to you? And that's on every single consent form. I know that it's not perfect, but I do appreciate how much work goes into trying to make that a more important part of life here. Our kids learn a lot of te reo Māori at school. Te reo Māori. I love my family. Me too. Kapai. It's woven into like every conversation. People use Māori words all the time. Like I'll get an announcement from the school and part of it will be in English or both English and Maori. I'm loving learning about it and I appreciate all the patients who have helped me along in that process. The pronunciations are not easy for me. They don't come naturally out of my Texan mouth, but I'm trying really hard to at least not butcher them and I hope I can continue to do better. The, what are the differences, if any, that you see in patient knowledge and or common patient concerns between the US and New Zealand? I'm from New Zealand and have always wondered if there are cultural differences between here and other places about things like shame around menstruation, endometriosis, etc. Very, very similar to what I had working in South Central Texas. The other question in this is how does the front line of abortion access look different? So in the US, I have made countless videos on abortion access. Most recently, I made one regarding what will happen if Roe v. Wade is overturned, and you can go watch that if you want more information on access in the US. In New Zealand, abortion is legal and government funded, meaning free to the person who is having it up until 20 weeks. There are more access points and easier access points, in my opinion, in New Zealand as compared to Texas. After 20 weeks, abortion is legal. If there is a clinical scenario that the physician feels warrants an abortion, and if that clinical scenario has been signed off by another consultant obstetrician who agrees that the clinical scenario warrants it, and there's no 
like massive rules around that. It's just signing off and getting documentation done. And that doesn't apply if there's an emergency situation happening. So definitely gives the autonomy to the person who is pregnant and to the healthcare team to make the decisions that they feel are best for the patient. Lots of people asking if I like it here, if I plan on coming back, how long we are staying, what the plan is, and I wish I could answer that. My job is technically permanent, but when we came, we told them we would be here for a year. At this point, having been here six months, I really love the practice. My kids are quite happy in school and my partner really loves it here. So right now we're considering extending that time if the medical council gives me the okay to stay past the one year where they've approved it until. That would be, again, an open-ended thing. It could be another six months or it could be another two years. It really just depends. Right now, we feel like this is a very safe place to be and our kids are very happy here. It's nice to not have to worry about kind of the state of affairs and stuff in the U.S. right now. So we'll kind of see um, how it's going and who runs in and is voted in the next election and go from there. I don't know if Roe v. Wade is overturned, if I will be able to come back to Texas just on a basis of not wanting to work somewhere that doesn't honor the autonomy and bodily consent of a person who is pregnant. Um, but we will see. I don't know. Something I find interesting that's a little bit different here is the practices around naming a baby. So back home, it was super common for people who were pregnant to have a name for the baby as soon as they found out the sex of the baby. So from like 20 weeks plus, a lot of people would already name the baby and have like monogrammed onesies and blankets and all of these things. And here, it's really, really uncommon for people to have committed to a name before a few days after a baby is born. It's really interesting to me. I don't think either one is good or bad. It's just very fascinating to me how different naming the baby is. I appreciate it because it took me forever to pick out names for my babies. Just a random thing that I've noticed. A question from Instagram is, is there a significant difference in your salary as compared to what you were paid in the US? Definitely a significant difference in salary. Doctors here are all paid on a scale of how many years it has been since they got out of training. In the US, income for doctors varies widely depending on what kind of practice you're in from your own private practice to employed in a big group practice to just working as a hospitalist or doing locums like I was. So there is a huge range of income in the US and here it's pretty much across the board the same for people who are surgical specialists and it's way lower. It's fine because there's a lot of perks, including getting to live in somewhere as beautiful as this, having the ability to work in a new culture and new healthcare system and learn new things. And we don't have to pay for healthcare insurance, which was incredibly expensive back home. If you come here, you know that you're taking a pay cut and certainly you don't come for the money. It's plenty of money to live and that's fine by me. How has work-life balance changed if it has? Definitely better work-life balance here. Currently, we are incredibly short-staffed where I'm at and we're hiring. So if you're a board-certified ob gyn and you are genuinely ready to make the leap out of wherever you are and into New Zealand, please email me. I will tell you all about it. Much better lifestyle. People here actually use their vacation days. People work incredibly hard, but they also acknowledge the importance of protecting yourself, which is something that is completely foreign to doctors who trained and worked in the US. You are actually paid overtime if you work in the public system for any hours over what you were hired for, which is unheard of in the US. You just get paid based on what you do or based on your salary where you're employed, no matter how many hours you actually end up working. Collegiality, work-life balance, taking time off, vacations, all of these things are significantly better here, culturally and socially more acceptable to take care of yourself. Are your kids starting to get Kiwi accents? The kids have definitely adopted the inflection that people from New Zealand use, which I don't even know how to explain it. I can hear it in my head, but it's kind of like in the US, if we we're going to ask a question, we would raise the like, octave at the end of it. They do that in most of their sentences, even if it's not a question. I'm editing and I decided I would research this because I thought it was an interesting thing. And in linguistics, this is apparently called a high rising terminal and it is common in a Kiwi accent. I'm going to put in a clip from a YouTube video I found of 
someone who is from here so that you can hear an example of what I mean. Where I tested her on Kiwi slang, I picked a few of the more difficult ones and put it to the test, difficult ones and put it to the test, so you can go and see how she did. And the kids are picking up on some of that and they're definitely using some of the words that are more common here. They like to use rubbish now instead of trash, jandals instead of flip-flops, gumboots instead of rain boots, crisps instead of chips, chips instead of fries, tomato sauce instead of ketchup, all of these little things that vary by where you're at in the world. My son told me he thinks I'm three meters tall. There's some things like that in medicine too. First off, this is super annoying. Almost all the medication names are different. Even for some of them, the generic names are different. Second, some of the medications we really commonly use in the US, like Benadryl or Diphenhydramine, don't exist here. You can't get them. The way that you prescribe medications is a bit different because some of them are fully funded by the government and some are not. Instruments in the operating room have almost completely different names. And that has been like hard for me because when you learn to operate, it almost becomes second nature to ask for things. Luckily, Everybody who works here is used to working with foreign doctors because they have a lot of people coming through doing locums or coming from other countries to fill in when it's really short staffed and things like that. So they're used to working with people who don't know the right name of medication. I mean, who don't know the name of the instruments as they do. So they do pretty good interpreting what I'm saying. And I've done my best to try to learn the names again, but it's hard, old, <laughs> old habits die hard. There's also a little bit of difference in management of certain conditions, like they don't do um, as much group B strep testing here. They don't do inductions uh, until 24 hours after your water has broken. All of these things that we did all the time back home that are not really done here. I don't think any of them are better or worse, but it is hard to get used to when you've only worked in one system and figuring out like the differences in the timing for induction planning and the recommendations for how often to get an ultrasound and things like that. So lots of little things that vary, but overall, obviously babies are born in the same ways all over the world and the surgical procedures themselves are pretty similar. So overall, Practice of medicine is quite similar, but there are some small differences that were a bit of a learning curve to get used to. How do you like the differences in school for the kids? Overall, I think that the school system here is excellent and based on school rankings, that would be consistent with how well kids do after they've been learners in New Zealand. I think that it's much more laid back and they go at nine and get home at three, which is much shorter than the day when we had the kids in elementary school in Texas. They got there at like 745, I think, and they came home at 3.30 maybe. Preschool here is called Kendi. So my youngest Pax is in Kendi. And something really cool they do is provide 20 hours of free childcare for kids over the age of three for everybody which is incredible. And so we're spending way less on childcare than we were back home. The kids like the school. I think the school is great. It's a very like open-ended approach. Instead of teaching them to answer multiple choice questions, there's a really big focus on teaching them to express their thoughts and ask questions and write long form answers as early as possible and things like that. So I, I do I do really like the school system here. How do you dress for the cold as a Texan being so down far south? So yes, it is cold here right now. It's winter because seasons are opposite on this side of the world. And we live in a very Southern part of New Zealand, so it gets pretty cold. I just layer up and we lived in Colorado for this winter last year. And so we are used to dressing for the cold, but there are some days when I'm like, oh my gosh, it's too cold for my Texan blood in this town. When was your first trip to New Zealand? My first New Zealand trip was in 2011 with my then relatively new husband and we had a wonderful time and we loved it and we thought it was beautiful and the culture and the people and the pace of life was just all awesome. We went to the North Island. That was when we first started talking about, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could move there someday? But it was never like serious. And then when I was graduating residency, we really seriously looked into moving here and it was gonna be a little bit complex because of the differences in training. So I decided to go ahead and do a few years in practice, make sure I could get my full board certification, finish my oral boards, all of that before we started seriously looking into moving. So then in 2018, we came to the South Island with all of the kids. Well, Pax was a teeny embryo at that point, but we had a great South Island road trip and went hiking and spent time in an RV. And it was just amazing. During that trip, we were like, okay, 
this has to be more than just a pipe dream. We have to figure out a way to actually make it happen. We love it here. It's beautiful. We live relatively rural, but there's everything we need in this town and it's within a few hours drive of some of the most beautiful places on the planet and a weekend trip to some of my favorite hikes in the world. We are quite happy. What was your biggest or most difficult adjustment cultural and social norms wise? You know, I don't know that there's a whole lot of cultural or social norms that we had trouble adjusting to. I'm trying to think of anything specific, but it, it wasn't, I didn't feel a big culture shock. I like that the pace of life is a little slower. Sometimes it feels different, but sometimes it feels the same. Honestly, the hardest thing to get used to was how long it takes to order something online and have it shipped here, which is such a first world problem, but it is annoying when you come from being able to get like two day Amazon delivery for free to paying $25 to get something here in two weeks. So that is a little frustrating. But other than that, I, I don't think there's been a ton of culture shock or problems adjusting. The Mexican food is quite lacking. I do miss good Mexican food. Would you say that general attitudes towards pregnancy and birth and all things reproductive health, et cetera, are very different there than in the U.S.? I.e., is it more relaxed, more focused on natural birth, not an automatic epidural, et cetera? Yeah, there's a little of that. I think that it's person to person and also probably depends on where you live. Again, we are quite rural, so home birth and outside maternity unit births that don't have access to like operating rooms is a lot more common out of necessity because it's so many hours to get to some of the more rural places that don't have a hospital like Teano and places that are like our district but it takes several hours to get there so luckily they have good midwives and we can transfer by helicopter we get lots of helicopter transfers in and I think that the outcomes here are certainly better for home birth and things like that because the midwives here all have standardized training and most of them would not just go straight into doing very rural home births without lots of experience in the hospital. I still, after seeing the things that I've even seen here, would not choose a home birth for myself, but outcomes here, as opposed to the US, if you look at home birth, and I have a whole video on why, are, are very different. There are less people who choose an epidural, and it is sometimes more difficult to get an epidural here because of some of the staffing as well as the regulations that they have around it. Um, we don't have central monitoring where you can see like the fetal heart rate strips from the uh, group nurses station. And so somebody has to be physically in the room with the patient the whole time after they get an epidural. Most of the midwives will be happy to do that and are epidural certified and would be at the bedside with the patient throughout their labor and delivery anyway. But it is a little bit less common and a little bit more difficult, I would say. Other things are really similar. I think the general attitudes about pregnancy and birth are quite similar to the US. Okay, that's all for today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I know it's just a little bit different when I do just these chatting and less educational Q&A videos, but a lot of you seem to like them, so I would try to do one every once in a while. If you're new here and you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you'd like to. I will see you next Monday.